Well, thanks everyone for joining us and welcome to tonight's talk. We're so glad you're here. Um, for folks who don't know me, I'm Eric White. I'm the adult services librarian here at the Estes Valley Library. Um, I'll just say a few quick words about the series that this program is part of. Um, so every year uh, since 2011, the Estes Valley has celebrated community and literacy by coming together to be in conversation around a single book. We call this One Book, One Valley. Um, this year, that book is Finders Keepers by Craig Childs, and I'm excited to be continuing our exploration of the book and the perspectives and issues around it with tonight's program. We also have a number of great programs still to come. There's more information on the website, estesvalleylibrary.org. And of course, as you may know, the series will culminate with an in-person visit from Craig Childs on Monday, February 6th, and that will also be on Zoom. Uh, so before um, we get started, um, a few, before I introduce Betsy, a few quick words about tonight's program. Um, after the introduction, uh, she and I will be in conversation for somewhere maybe around half an hour, um, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. And uh, so for the Q&A part, I'll be taking questions through the chat and passing them on to Betsy. Uh, feel free to submit questions at any time during the program. Um, and just so you know, this is a Zoom webinar, so you won't be able to see the names of, the, of other participants or attendees unless they comment in the chat. Uh, so now I'd like to introduce our guest. Um, Betsy Chapus is a member of the U Indian tribe of the uh, Uinta and Ure Reservation in Utah. She currently serves as Director of Cultural Rights and Protection for the tribe. She's worked on cultural rights and, and protection for more than 33 years. Uh, her mentor in the field was uh, Museum Director, Lay Archaeologist, and Spiritual Leader Clifford Duncan who has incidentally visited Estes Park a number of times and worked with the folks at Rocky Mountain National Park. So, Betsy, I'd like to turn it over to you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and the, and the work you do? Sure. So, like you said, my name is Betsy Chapuz. I am, the, um, I am also the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer we just assumed that status in 2021 in September. So um, us along with uh, Southern Ute, who, who is one of the uh, one of the tribes that reside in Colorado, have, uh, we were the 30, 301st and 302nd uh, tribal officer in the United States. So just wanted to wanted to say that, but um, like. Like Eric said, um, I worked for the tribe in this capacity for over 33, 33 plus years. And it's been, uh, we, we've, um, with Mr. Duncan's help, we've created this uh, department from being the tribal museum. And it's taken this long for us to assume the typical status. So that was our culmination that um, I'd worked toward for the last couple of years. Um, since Mr. Duncan is gone, that was something that he wanted. So that's um, kind of, that's what moved forward. And so um, you know, I'm really happy that we assume that responsibility. But, uh, you know, in my work, I do a number of different things. I mostly work with 106, which is a Native American consultation portion of the National Historic Preservation Act. My office is, uh, works directly under federal um, Policies. There's a lot of uh, policies that um, pertain to archaeology, which um, you know 106 is part of that. We also have the Native American Graves Protection Repatriation Act, which is uh, I'm also the representative for the tribe there. I also sit on the uh, Utah State um, Native American Remains and Review Committee. I'm the chairperson for that um, board, and that's that pertains to state lands. Um, and like I said, 
you know, there's just a lot of avenues. We work with probably, oh, right around 106 federal agencies within five states. That's our original um, land base that uh, the three tribes come from. There was 13 original bands. And so that's the land base that we, <coughs> excuse me, that we come from. Um, Estes Park being uh, part of the areas of our Aboriginal ter territories, Rocky Mountain, those areas we I, um, consult quite extensively in the state of Colorado as we have the Uncompahgre Unc Band of the Udindin tribe here in Fort Duchesne that was removed from the western slope of Colorado. And so uh, we do quite a bit of consultation for that western slope uh, area. Um, I kind of lost my train of thought here, but um, that's basically, you know, in a nutshell, uh, some of the highlights of the type of work I do. Although I do do community outreach, I work with a no number of youth groups. I work with um, off reservation, on reservation. Um, I've met with uh, a number of uh, civic groups and and uh, talk a little about. Um, the tribe, but one message that I really like to talk about is visiting with respect. And I think everything that we'll be talking about tonight is that is the foundation, is visiting with respect and being uh, mindful of where you're at. So that's one message that I like to really hit upon when I talk to um, community groups. The other thing is that I really believe in our youth. I think that that is one thing that um, we need to be very mindful of as our children. I think I know that they are our future. I know that you know one day one of those kids could be president, be the mayor of a town, be one of the community leaders. And so I really like to um, talk to the youth and uh, try to try to make myself memorable to them so that one day when they're out on the landscape and they're looking at something that they might say, hey, I remember that one youth lady, she said that about being out here. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to visit with respect. So that's just a little bit about me. And, and the other thing is I have eight kids. So that's the other part of this is that um, I'm really mindful about um, my kids and my grandkids and and letting them know, you know, the values of what we're, what we have today and and tomorrow. If we don't, we won't have what we have today if we don't are not mindful. You know, today we won't have nothing tomorrow. So that, that's it. And I'm I'm married. My um, my husband Samuel. He was uh, not raised on the reservation, but he was raised in Oklahoma. Although he's a youth, so he offers me some. Um, a different perspective sometimes, you know, sometimes you get kind of caught up in things, but he helps that along. My family's a big, they're uh, my biggest cheerleaders. So that's something that uh, like people probably don't think I have any kids because I used to travel all the time, people that know me, <laughs> but I do, I have, I have eight grown kids. So, and that's the most, what I'm most proud of in all the 33 years that I've been doing this work. And the other fact is that um, I knew Mr. Duncan and I was, um, I got to be his chauffeur for those of you that know him. So thank you. Thanks, Betsy. Um, and maybe tell us a little bit about how you got into the work that you do. Well, I originally started in, our, in the tribes um, energy and minerals department, which handles the oil and gas. And I was a clerk there. And um, I really, you know, uh, when I first started, I was about, I was 18 years old, just getting out of high school and they needed somebody to work there. So I started working there. And then as a department was coming together, they needed to, um, because on our reservation, when archeologists come out, they have to have somebody go out in the field with them. They don't allow them to just go come on the reservation and go out and do their work. They have to have somebody that takes them out in the field and watches them to make sure that they're, they're um, doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so um, I was tasked with lining up people. And at that point, um, there was really not 
very many tribal people that even knew anything about archaeology and we didn't know what archaeologists were or what they were supposed to be doing and so our the energy and minerals department created um, what they called culturally um oh gosh cc cppr and i can't think of the name right off the bat but culturally responsible people and so we enlisted the help of all tribal employees that were, tri that were tribal members and we gave these short courses in archeology span so that they would kind of know what some of the field techniques were and what they were, what archeologists were about and whatever. And so we had like these 30 people and that became my, um, my job to do that. And I found it quite interesting, but it still, I was going into computer science to think where I'd be if I did that 30 years ago. Anyway, but I, I ended up doing that. And, and at that time, I met, that's when I met Mr. Duncan. And he was the museum director. So I had been accepted to the University of Oklahoma. And I was going to go into computer science. And, um, but I had also just married my husband, too. And I uh, found out we were going to have, have our uh, first baby. And uh, I ended up not going to school. And so I was out, I had quit my job at Energy and Minerals and this program that I was part of, but Clifford remembered me. And then he, he called me as his um, museum sec secretary had just resigned, moved on to another job. And so that's how me, Mr. Duncan and I got met. And at that time too, it was just like these three worlds colliding because the tribe, the tribe recognized the fact that they needed to have, or the laws were changing in, in archaeology and we had to have somebody that could go out and, and do uh, 106 consultation and we didn't know a thing about that and I didn't know anything about it and so uh, that started my journey with Mr. Duncan and Mr. Duncan was elected to the tribal council too at that same time <laughs> so this is all happening within a couple of years and uh, he um, asked them to appoint me as the museum director and so I I'm like 21 years old. I don't even have a clue what I'm what I'm doing, but that's how I got started in this. And uh, I really had quite a, you know, I wish I'd share this with people and I'll share it with you all, but you know, um, I started doing this work. Like I said, I was green, I was green. I didn't even know nothing from nothing. I I had no idea what anything was, but before Mr. Duncan was elected to the council, we had been called to go to um, Dinosaur National Park for a uh, NAGPRA case. And, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't really know what, what that, what that meant or what it was, but we had gone, we had gone up to see, uh, we had gone up there to, to see what this was about. And, um, you know, they let us know that um, they had found a lady and her little baby. And, uh, it was one of the most uh, telling things in archaeology that that changed my my perception and my outlook because I had read, started reading some information about archaeology and all of that, and you know it's really impersonal. But she had a waddle and dawdle pot with her that was there in their shelter that where they had found them, and her handprints were on both sides of that pot. And they also had found her sandals of her and her little, her little boy and their footprints were bore into those sandals. And without her physically being there, how much closer could you see to these people, to our, to our ancestors? So that's, you know, that was changed changed my life and changed my perspective and that I think about that all the time that what we're doing is we're not just simply talking about objects and things that these are these are our ancestors these are the people these are what we're trying to not so much protect but give them their essence with you and with me so that they have a meaning their life was, their life had a meaning. And just because we, we talk sometimes about these things in very abstract ways, but that was, you know, that was my, 
my aha moment that really this really always I always carry that in my heart that that lady showed me that with her child to make me who I am today along with Mr. Duncan who taught me what that meant and and how to move forward with that yeah so it's, it sounds very it was a very personal right experience yeah, I really was uh, on a different path. I really, really, there was no inkling in my mind. I never, you know, I, I never knew what archaeology was. Well, I kind of knew because I worked in the energy and minerals and I knew they were doing archaeological surveys and whatever, but it, it was really uh, something that really, really um, touches you to the very core. So that's how I got started. Thanks. Yeah. Can I ask just for folks who um, like to step back a little bit for folks who may not know, um, could you, would you mind giving just a little bit of a background on, on the Ute people, where your, where your ancestral lands are and um, maybe briefly like how um the different you tribes came to be in the in the places where they are currently so the you tribe as a whole i call them the you tribe i'll say for for so we don't get all messed up because our tribal our official government name is the you tribe of the Winton all right indian reservation i some, sometimes that confuses people because when we talk about the you tribe um, when I'm talking about the Ute tribe, I'm generally talking about, about our tribe. But the Ute nation, as we sometimes refer to it as, um, comprises the Southern Ute and the Ute Mountain Ute tribes from Ignacio and um, Toyok. And then we are, uh, we are here in Fort Duchesne, Utah. But we were originally 13 bands that encompassed all of um, Utah the southern parts of Wyoming, all of Colorado, excuse me, the um, western part of um, Nebraska, and even into the Oklahoma Panhandle, and the northern parts of New Mexico and Arizona. So we had this vast territory that we, um, you know, we hunted on. We didn't, we didn't live on all the land at all the time. We did seasonal rounds. So we'd go to the high country in the summer when it was hot and we would go to the low country um, it, when it would get um, cooler. But we did follow the seasons. So we have these seasonal um, rounds that we did for um, game and, and um, you know, the plant use and all of that, but they're, um, I know you guys want me to say all 13 of the original bands, but I'm, I can't, uh, I can't uh, uh, remember all of them at, at right now, but, um, but they were separated when the government came in and moved us to reservations. Originally, the, um, the Utes were to have all of the state of Colorado. And as the um, settlers moved west, that diminished to half of Colorado, then to a quarter of Colorado. Then we had the Meeker incident, which had the um, Uncompahgre band removed from the Western slope of Colorado into Utah. And um, Brigham Young was, at the time, he was the agent or the governor for this territory here in Utah. And so Lincoln had asked him whether he would want um, the Utes placed. And so they placed us here in Northeastern Utah. And our um, our band, our tribe, we have three bands, the Uncompahgre, the White River, and the Guintas. And we originally had three separate reservations here in Utah. But when um, Lincoln signed the proclamation that um, placed all those three bands together. And so now we have what we call our Northern Extension and our Southern Extension, the Southern Extension being the Uncompahgre portion with the with the Northern Extension being the um, uh, uh, Uinta and the White River. 
So Southern Ute and Ute Mountain, they also are comprised of several bands, but they were pushed. And I don't know if very many of you know this, but the um, Mesa Verde National Park was part of Southern Ute's original reservation. So when they wanted to declare that as a national park, they took that portion of uh, Southern Ute's reservation and uh, designated it as national park land and, and withdrew that from the Southern Ute's reservation boundaries. And so our reservation here in Utah, we encompass almost 2.3 million acres. We have federal land holdings that are about 1.4 million acres within that exterior boundaries. Southern Ute and Ute Mountain. Southern Ute is checkerboarded much like we are, which means that we have lands that are fee and private lands, but we have allotted and tribal lands, much like Southern Ute. Ute Mountain has a, a solid land base. And I don't know, I'm sorry, but I don't know the acreages of both of those reservations. But as you can see, we have quite a vast territory. We have um, um, Arapahoes many times will um, talk about their relationship with the Utes. So we have a kinship with a lot of uh, some of the, the Plains tribe, the Arapahoes from Oklahoma and also up in Wyoming um, have kinship with the tribe here. Even the Crows, the Crows have a story. We have a, a one Ute warrior that fought with the with uh, Northern Cheyenne when um, they had the, the Battle of the um, Big Bighorn Battle Plus, I can't think what it's called, but he fought with them. But there are stories of Utes being all up into um, Montana. And also for our tribe, we have what's called the Ute Odyssey. When our um, tribal members were protesting um, the creation of an irrigation system here in, in uh, on the reservation, and they they walked to South Dakota with the Cheyenne River Sioux, where they were given ten acres to live on. But they walked to southern to so the southern Cheyenne tribe because they were in protest of of trying to control the water because you know, like we say, everything has an essence, and water is one of the most important elements of that has an essence and they didn't believe that it was right. And within our culture, we don't do that to water. We don't try to capture that water. And that's kind of what they saw as the irrigation um, system as it was moving forward. So we do have some of our youth people are buried at Fort Meade in South Dakota and also on the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation in South Dakota. Well, that's just kind of all over the place, kind of a history, because <laughs> there's a there's a lot to it. So, yeah, thanks for that. Uh -huh. Thanks for educating us on that a little bit. Um, sp kind of sp speaking of um, of some of the things that you just mentioned, um, I I know in previous programs we've talked about repatriation and why that's important and. How tribes work with museums and other organizations, um, but I want to step back just a little bit and and kind of go deeper into the the objects that we call artifacts. Um, so, like when you when you look at something that may have been made by an ancestor or by someone who in your community who's still alive, or or even something in nature, as you mentioned, um, what do you see? What's What's important to know about that object and, and what do you consider when thinking about how you handle or, or treat that object? You know, when I first started this work, um, Mr. Duncan said to me, I want you to always remember that these people live their religion, that they live their religion. So that means that they woke up in the morning and they gave thanks to the sun for coming up for the day. Every time they collected food, they, they gave thanks for that. If they took a life to feed them the animal's life, they, they thank that spirit. Even when they talk to uh, 
the fire and father fire everything has an essence to it everything has a importance in a place in our world everything does so when i look at objects that maybe some people might look at as beautiful in an art piece i think about those people and what they put into that in making of that what that piece re represents what is that what is it what is it um representing or what look at all the natural elements within that you know my son made for um colorado springs they are they are developing an exhibit system an exhibit for, on the Utes, and they asked some of our our people to do things and my my son he is a beater he's an artist and that way he beads and he creates things and he makes cradle boards so when he went out to make that cradle board because they either you know some of them are made with uh, plywood now they cut the shape and then they do it that way but he went out and got the willows. And when he collected those willows, he said, he said a, a prayer and asked for forgiveness for taking that plant and telling them what he was going to do with that. So when he prepared those willows for that cradle board, he prayed again and told them, you know, this is what I'm doing. I want you to, to know that I don't mean you any harm. And I left that and I'll take care of this water and so when he got done soaking those willows he took that water and he poured it on in his garden because once you when you take those willows and you soak them that water has life chemicals in it like fertilizer and you don't go and you don't just pour things and throw things out you have to take care of every piece that you're using you know, and that's the same way when he got the buckskin for that cradle board. He he did that buckskin himself. He smoked it. He tanned it. He worked it. And he thanked that animal for giving him that skin. That's what I see. You can walk down that line of every part of that. That's what I see. That's what I know. That's the importance of why we say, you know, everything has an essence because there's a lot of that. And our people live their religion. That's a, something that we need to come back to as all of us, as all people. But that's what I see. So when we're talking about repatriation and bringing that back, some tribes don't want don't believe that they should come back but they should go back to where they were close where they were found because maybe whether it's with a burial or maybe they found it it was in something and they found it there those things are placed there with care with prayers with words with a sentiment from somebody they were put there and they were told, this is where I'm going to put you away. That's what we call it, putting it away. That's what I see. And it, so it sounds like a there's a, a big element of kind of honoring the intent, honoring the essence of things and and the intent with which with, with which things were created. Yeah, that that would that's that's kind of it's um you know it's 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 respecting that it's respecting it's all about respect it's all about respecting what you have and what you're taking and what you're giving and what you're giving back you know it's it's all part of that process of respecting life. And does that apply? Um, I think in, in our discussion, you mentioned how this can also apply to places. 
can you talk like um like you mentioned bears ears as an example can you talk a little bit about that yes i think um and you know i have a hard time with this in in this way all of these lands there's a bears ears in it there's some place that's special that means something to maybe you, to maybe me. Maybe it's your grandma's house. Maybe it's your, your dad's place, your dad's ranch. Maybe it's something along those lines where, where a place that you can go to heal, to rejoice, to grieve, to find inspiration. There's, there's that kind of a place for all of us. But, you know, because we live in this type of a world, we live in that now we have this place called Bears Ears. But it's, um, Bears Ears is a, is a special place. You, you can see that from all of the, um, all of the uh, memories that were left there, you know. When you, when, you, when you see these broken pots and things like that, you know that there were people there, they were doing things. And it is, uh, Bears Ears is, is a place for, for um, people to come together and um, heal themselves if that's, the, there's, if that's what they, their purpose. But, um, you know, I'm, I've, um, right now I'm working on, working in, with two different groups on um, writing some management plans. And so my, I kind of got off those phone calls today, but you know, that's where my, my mind is going is because we're asked these things in a very linear way. We have these federal processes that are very linear, very linear. But we as Native people, we see things more circular because it's forever going on and on. And so, um, you know, in talking about bears ears, that's kind of what we're trying to perpetuate is, is this place of, um, that can give you healing can help you with your with whatever it is that you want help with and it's a very special place for a lot of tribes and uh you know it it's that same way that we um our office we I, we because we work with a lot of federal agencies and this is federal lands always tell them you know we we manage comprehensively as tribal people we I believe that we all manage comprehensively because we're, we're not like a Maraca people, Maracachu, you guys are Maracachu, where you can take the, the sunlight from the water or the land from the water and you can put them in these boxes and you can address these impacts to water, to soils, to all this. In my world, those are all interrelated. You have to manage for that landscape. And that's kind of what we're talking about with um, Bears Ears. Is it's a very, you have to look at the full picture and the comprehensiveness of that. And everything that we do to that landscape, we do to things on that landscape. So that's how, you know, I see these places and again, like I was saying, you know, you might have that, you may not call it bears ears, but you call it something and you do something to that, it's going to affect the way that you interact with that, that um, what it is that's special to you. And that's the same way these things have been happening. This, this area has been molested for so long that uh, we have to bring it back. We need to bring it back so that it can be utilized for what, what it has 
and all the resources that it has within that natural environment. That's not as uh, clear as I could, I want to say it, but I'm just kind of uh, um, trying to jump out of my federal mode into a tribal, <laughs> tribal speak, so sorry. <laughs> no, no. As good as I, I would like to have said that, but yeah. Is it hard, do you find it like often difficult to, to get that frame of reference across to get people to understand things that way? I do. You know, it's, it's really hard. It's like this. This is, it's like this. Somebody calls me on the phone and says, I got a ranch and I want it to have a ute name and it's called Blue Sky. So how do you say that in ute? Well, ute wasn't made to be translated into English. You can't, there's certain things about that that you have to, you have to use certain words because certain things can't happen. And so like, uh, like, you know, like for instance, my uncle used to be a translator for the tribal council and they'd go to um, Washington DC because Back then, he just passed away a couple months ago, but he was 89 when he passed away. But for the tribal council, he was a young man back in his 20s, and he used to translate for for the tribal council. And uh, they went to dinner, and he uh, he was. Uh, they said they asked him, "What are we eating?" And they had the menu there, and so he one of the items on the menu was a hard roll. And so he was like, <laughs> a hard roll. Then he said, what is that? He had to ask them, what is a hard roll? And uh, they said, it's bread. It was, it was a bread, it's a biscuit or something. But he did said that in you, and that meant that somebody was flipping on the ground, like just mad or angry falling on the ground and that's what he told them and they were like what why are they why do they want us to do that and he said no that was what they called their bread that didn't make sense to them because you, you couldn't you couldn't have that word in you and that's kind of that's kind of the same the same way as trying to um relay something you're not, you're kind of handicapped because you can't say it in, in your language. You have to say it in a way that people can understand. And I, I often have that, um, I often uh, have that frustration, but, you know, I've come to, to try to, that's why I said I'm wearing this uh, federal process hat sometimes because I have to use the language that you're, that you're in to, to convey that. And one of the things I talk about is um, like talking about managing comprehensively and how um, tribes go from the big to the small. That's how I see it. If we wanted to put something like a, like a, um, I don't know, a, a transmission um, line here, First, we would look at the environment and say, what's around here? Is it okay to put it there? And then go to the, come down smaller and smaller until it's the point that these, this transmission line would be in. But in the government, they just say, we're gonna put the transmission line here. Now you guys figure out all the environmental effects that's gonna have. So it's kind of upside down. And that's kind of how it is when, when you're, um, doing you to English, it's kind of, sometimes it's backwards because some things like rocks and stuff, they can't, they can't do things like they, they say, oh, that rock broke my window. We can't be, have a rock and you break a window unless somebody threw it, you threw it, I threw it, the dog kicked it up, the horse kicked it. Something had to make that rock break that because it doesn't make sense. So, 
sometimes when you're um, thinking about in tribal in your tribal ways, it kind of it's kind of like that. It can't it doesn't make sense because there has to be some other catalyst that has to happen before things can happen. But anyway, that's getting way off the. <laughs> but that's kind of a little bit of my world when I'm talking to federal agencies. Uh, yeah, thanks for that. Thanks for that analogy. Yeah, it, it does sound like a challenge. Um, so I want to open it up to questions from our audience. And uh, as I mentioned, feel free, if you have a question, just um, put it in the chat and I will, I will pass those along. So um, let's see. So we have, we have, we have one question on our, on our chat so far, which, um, and that we're, this, this will kind of, um, take us kind of take us straight into some of these issues. It's actually about, um, land acknowledgements. And so this, we have someone who's curious, like, do you have thoughts on, um, land acknowledgements? Like what, what do they mean to you, to your community? I have a lot of thoughts on land acknowledgements. Um, our office has been dealing with land acknowledgements for probably about 10 years now. I've had many, many organizations that have contacted me about land acknowledgements. And um, I really think they are meaningless. I really um, don't. I, th I think the concept behind a land acknowledgement at some point had some meaning, but I have, this is my experience with land acknowledgements. I have organizations that will send me two or three lines and say, and it, they may be way off base and I will talk to them a little bit. And then they'll, they'll maybe do a little bit of a rewrite and then send it back to me and say, um, you know, I, I have one, one group that, uh, it, it was saying all these big fancy words in it. But one of the things that I told them is they were talking about how the people left the area are, they were, they were alluding to that. And in their acknowledgement, they alluded to the, like the, the, the native people just got up and said, oh, I'm just gonna go someplace else. I mean, I'm, I'm gonna go live in Utah now. So you guys, here you go. Here you got. You guys are all coming in. So here you go. Here's this land. Do with it what you will. And uh, you know. And I told them the hard truth is, like for the Uncompahgre Band, we were removed from this land by the U.S. government. We were forcibly marched at gunpoint to Utah. You know, Mr. Duncan told me that you know his mother was a very little girl when that happened but she recalls how the women wailed wailed as if somebody had died when they were moving them to someplace that they did not know anything about when they took them out of the where their homes were where their children grew up where their language was born and for it to be made into something that casual of, you know, selling our house and moving on to another place. I just couldn't get this group to understand that. We emailed back and forth three or four times. And I just finally said, you know what? This isn't my acknowledgement, this is yours. And if that's what you want it to read, fine, then do it that way. Because I'm not writing this to myself. If you don't know the meaning behind what you're trying to say or what you're trying to do, or you're you're just wanting to put this up on the board and say, hey, the Ute tribe had a had a hand in this, and this is this is what we came up to with together, then um, you know, I can't help you. And I've had I've had that experience many times over. I've even had a university write a land acknowledgement that I would, and 
I was appalled. It offended me so badly. I did not even want to um, read it anymore or, or help them. I just told them, you know, you, you are a school of learning and to put what you put into this land acknowledgement is ridiculous. And that has been my experience. At one point, we were probably getting land, about 10 land acknowledgements a week. And then uh, another part of that is that um, these land acknowledgements, they want somebody from our tribal council to go or to be on a call or to go wherever to accept those land acknowledgements. Our tribal council is like the president of the United States. They are not waiting for people to invite them to go someplace. You know, they're dealing with things on a national level they're also dealing with things on a local level. And it's just not that you call me up on Monday and say, hey, we're gonna present this land acknowledgement to your council. Can you get one of your councilmen to come over and accept this? So, you know, I don't know whether that opens people's eyes to, to tribes and that we're not all just sitting around waiting for somebody to give us something to do. And so that's been my experience with land acknowledgements. And I just really, you know, um, here in the state of Utah, this, um, they have what they call um, Native American consultation protocol. One of their things is that they do a land acknowledgement whenever they open a meeting. One of the state departments do that. But it doesn't have to be um, you know, they don't require any tribes to be there or anything. They just acknowledge to the people that we know that these tribes are here and that we are on their land and through no fault of their own. They're not here. They're, they were removed or whatever it may be. But, you know, they, they don't, it, that is something that, because we have what's called the Native American Summit with our, uh, with the state of Utah, that it was something that was really discussed at length about doing these uh, land acknowledgements. But I really, I really do. I really have a hard time with some of the, I, I read a land acknowledgement and I won't even say where, but you guys will probably look around at some of the, it was six pages long. I just could, I couldn't get what what that was trying to get to. I don't know, but so anyway, that that's my experience. Is I really I really have a hard time with it, and maybe it's because um, like, like I told you before, we our reservation is over two million acres, and then we work with about one hundred and five federal agencies and state agencies, and I have a staff of two. I have myself and my clerk. And in the summer, we have a field technician. So, you know, it's kind of, it's a little daunting <laughs> to, to try to help people who really don't want to be helped. So anyway. Thanks for, yeah, thanks for being, <laughs> sorry to, Sorry to throw us right into um, <laughs> something that can be controversial, and and thanks for sharing your your perspective on those like frustrating and hard things. We appreciate it. Sure. So, um, let's see. I've been i I've been listening and not looking at the chat. So let me let me find our next question. Um, Let's see. Um, can you can you help us understand? Um, so, let's see. This is someone would like to know. Um, can you help us understand how to most respectfully think about the fact that your ancestors hunted and utilized the Estes Valley, where we now live? instead of um instead of your community and how can we behave most respectively most respectfully 
day to day here. I that's think kind of a big if, question, sorry. No, that's all right. I think if you don't understand, first of all, how to live respectfully day to day, that is not something you're gonna get out of this talk at this moment. I think you really need to look at what you're doing and, and see how that goes. But I don't think that, um, I don't think that our ancestors are gone from, from Estes Park. I don't think that they're gone from anywhere. I think one of the things is um, when we're talking about an essence, when we're talking about places that we still walk there, that we still are there. We still are there in our spirit. We still, you know, one thing is as Mr. Duncan and, uh, you know, as we travel through all this homeland toward the end of his um, life, he, he was losing his vision. He was losing his vision and his hearing. But we would go, I would tell him, sometimes he would go with me and sometimes he would not go with me out in the field. But I'd tell him where I'm going. And he would say, I know, I know that place. So when you go there, you do this. And when you do that, I'm gonna know in my mind's eye, I'm gonna know that and I'm gonna be there with you. And he says, you know, we're always, we're always there, no matter what. Because when he would walk, if anybody had been in the, in the field with him, he would walk and he'd go off by himself. And he'd always come back either whistling or singing a song. And so on our drive back, he would always say to me, did you hear that? Did you catch that? That's where I got this song from. Did you see that? Did you see that? That's where I got this from. So don't think you ever can remove that. That's just like wiping your memory out. Just like you maybe, again, coming back to your family or somebody very dear to you and you go back to where, where you remember them or great hunting spot with your, or a great fishing spot with your grandfather and you stand there, you get that feeling, you can feel that. You can, maybe your grandpa's been gone for a while. You, you get that, you can feel that. They're still there. And that's the way you should treat it as if they're still there. Be mindful, be respectful. That's how you can, that's the biggest thing that you can do is be respectful when you're there. And teach your children, your grandchildren the same thing. Thanks for that answer. Mm -hmm. Let's see, we have a question. Um, Clifford Duncan spoke about his boarding school experience and boarding schools have been in the news, whether in Canada or the US. The governor of Colorado has staff looking into boarding schools in the state. Have you or other members been contacted to participate in um, dealing with the history or um, bringing forth the history of boarding schools? There is actually a task force in the state of Colorado that are looking at the boarding schools that tribal folks are part of. That um, that that is not um, that hasn't stopped. That is still going. That is going on right now. So um, one of the uh, one of the boarding schools that is 
that the the state is trying to really push forward is the Teller Institute um, boarding school in Grand Junction, because that land has gone out of um, of uh, state. Well, I think it's still in state lands, but it's um, they're trying to rebuild the the school itself is completely gone, and they they know that there were children that that died there and that are buried there, but they do not know where those, that cemetery is. And there has been another building erected over the top of that and they want to demolish that and to build it into another building. And it's come to light that there were, um, I think there's about 12 graves, but they don't know where it's at. And so that has been um, moving forward because Colorado has a committee, our uh, department, I think it's a department that's called the, oh gosh, what's it called now? We, we have an Indian Affairs Office here in, in this, under the state government here. And Colorado has, this, has a similar office, but they are the ones that deal with uh, Native American human remains on state lands in Colorado. And so they're pushing this forward to try to help find um, where the cemetery may be in, for this Teller Institute. So it isn't, they are not, they haven't done away with those, with looking at those boarding schools. And I think that they're really concentrating right now on the Teller Institute and with, with all of the tribes. And because it's a national focus, um, we had one of our little gals um, return to us from Pennsylvania. She was at the Carlisle Indian Boarding School and she was returned this past summer and we had a reburial ceremony for her. We brought her home. She passed away when she was 14. She'd been at in Pennsylvania since 1906 and we finally brought her home. But that's, that is a very um, sensitive and very hurting um, process this boarding school because you think about these things and about how young some of these children were. My grandma was taken when she was four years old and taken to California. Her um, mother died in childbirth with her younger sister. And she, my grandmother stayed in California for three years. She came home when she was seven and her dad had died too. So she'd never seen her mom and dad after she left. She stayed on Catalina Island and worked in the, worked in the rich homes there as part of their, um, their servants or, or whatever she would do that. And she was also a playmate to some of their kids but she came back when she was seven. And uh, so it was just her and her um, sister and they were raised by, by their dad's um, brother. So that, that boarding school is very traumatic time for a lot, of, a lot of people, a lot of tribal people. And it's really hard to um, talk about it because like I said, you know, little Lottie there, she, she um, she wasn't there very long, but, but she, she passed away. And, uh, you know, it wasn't just till recently that we were able to um, finally get her home because part of, the, part of the problem is, is that some of these boarding schools are um, like, the, like the churches, like Catholic church was a big part of some of these creations of these boarding schools. Other were military base, much like Carlisle. So if the military is handling that and they don't want to utilize NAGPRA, which is a federal law, and there's no funding from the United States government to return these, these children. And so that's another, you know, funding is another um, reason why some of these are not, they are not being held up in, in, in you know, they know it's there, but they don't have any way to fund um, getting these children back to, to their families or to their tribes. And some of them have been taken over as state lands. Those lands that these boarding schools were on were 
converted to the state. So now you're dealing with the state and how are they going to fund it and how you got to fall underneath that state um, governments in order to move that forward. So yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, I'm I'm glad the I'm glad you were able to get the little girl home and thanks for being willing to talk about talk about that and share. Yeah. We appreciate that. So I'm gonna bring it, I might bring it back a little bit to um artifacts and, and objects on uh, nature. Um I remember in in our discussion you know, you talked about whether, um, like whether you can use something for say food or for medicine depends on how you approach that. Um, if I'm, if I'm getting it right, uh, if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, um, like I think you gave an example of like, um, like using strawberries or something like that for, for food or for medicine. And, you know, if, if somebody had, had run cattle through there, you know, it, it can you talk a little bit about, excuse me, yeah, sure. So, you know, that's, um, when I was talking about looking at, um, these at a land landscape, um, view or maybe a bird's eye view you know you're looking at the complete area certain certain things certain ways you have to have a, a certain type of environment to use it one way or the other so when you have areas that are um you know, like you're talking about cows grazing in there and you might have a plant that may be used medicinally, but who wants to be in there with when you've got cow, cow manure all over the place and whatever, you use it a different way. And the other part of that is, is the way that you capture that plant, the way that you're gonna use it because you you got a way that you're gonna use that and you got that in your mind and you know that you're, it's there and it's in that place that you can do that. And that is the way, because you because I talked earlier about thanking for things and how they live their religion, how we, you know, that's where we want to be again. And, and that's the way you, you approach that much is you, if you want to use that for medicine, you want to talk to it and say, hey, need your help. I want you to do this. My granddaughter, she's sick. I need you. I need you to help me. I want you to stay in there. I'm not going to hurt you. I want you to come home and, and help out my my daughter, my granddaughter, whatever it is. And you you pick it and you collect it in a certain way. Same thing for food. I'm going to take you. I'm going to take some of this that you have. In a nourish my body, nourish my family, help me with that, keep them healthy, let them have a strong mind. It's all about that respect. That's, that's the same way, that intent of what you're going to do with that. And also not overdoing it. Don't take all of it. You know, I, I you know, that that's really, my grandma used to all take us pinion picking and she'd tell us to, if we're noisy, if we're rambunctious, you know, we're young kids. And she'd tell us that if you get loud and you get noisy and you're laughing and carrying on, that's going to be an empty shell we're going to get. So when we go, we have to be very quiet and we'd have all our tools and things we're going to bring the, um, and she would say, when you threaten to get those cones, you don't bang it like this. You be nice and gentle and talk to them. So we'd have to be that way when we go, because if we had empty shells, then we were the ones that 
were naughty and didn't do what we were supposed to do. We didn't do it right. But, you know, my grandma used to always <laughs> tell us those things when we were going out with her to, to collect stuff, that how we were supposed to do it, how we were supposed to present ourselves. How, you know, even, even the way you're dressed is part of that. Respecting, respect. Anyway. Thanks. Yeah. And I, I remember, I remember you also mentioning like, you know, that regarding some of those knowledges and, and practices that, you know, it's not always, um, it's not always appropriate to share that knowledge outside your community. Can you, can you talk a little bit about why that is? Yeah, it isn't. The information that we have as tribal people is not for everybody. It's not appropriate sometimes for us to share something, even if we know know it, because, you know, in this day, in this day and age too, we have a lot of people that, that um, want to um, copy it. I think I told you that I had bags and bags of, uh, of uh, bear root here in my office because we there was on one of the forests people had gone out and collected all of this bear root and they illegally collected it they had sacks and sacks of this stuff and so because they knew that um it has medicinal properties because they had read up on what bear root was and all of that and so they had collected it, but they didn't. And so the Forest Service people thinking they're doing a good thing gave us those bags, but we could not do, we could not use it because of the way it was collected. It was shoveled and pulled out of the ground and put into these bags. That's not the way we collect that plant. We have to, and you know, you have to know how to collect it. Again, coming back to for the use of what you're going to have that plant for. And so, you know, and we don't share every piece. Of, when I tell you a story, I'm not telling you the whole story. I might be, I'm only giving you an, a taste, as my grandma would say, so that you would know something about that. But when it's your time to know it all, then you'll know it all because it isn't for you, because sometimes it can hurt you. Sometimes it's not even for me, because some things are for men and some things are for women. So you can't, you can't say the whole thing because, you know, it, it's, it, if you don't know how to take care of it, then you're going to be, you're going to be hurting. And much like, I think I, I did share with like the, the sweat lodge and what happened down in Arizona for the man that was selling um, people to come into that sweat lodge ceremony. And that was not right. And look what happened. People died. Oh. That good? Yeah, <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for sharing that. Um, so we have, let's see, we have a question from someone in the community. Um, if you come across an item that appears to be of indigenous origin, what is the process for returning it to its rightful place? Well, in this day and age, we have property laws. <laughs> First of all, you need to figure out where you're at. Are you on federal land, state land? Where are you at? Where are you at on the landscape? Because you don't want, I don't want to tell you something that's going to get you in trouble with the law. <laughs> but um, I would report it to an official if you know where you're at. If you're on private property, um, you know, in the state of Colorado, even in the state of Utah, there are state laws that um, if you're on private property, then that belongs to the landowners. So, you know, that may not be what you wanted to hear, but 
that I have to be mindful of that because I cannot say, oh, if you know if it's of native origin and whatever, but you, you could you could call your maybe your state archaeologist or um, if you're on federal lands, contact the agency that you know of that can help you to figure out whose um, jurisdiction or which agency that that may fall under and uh, proceed that way. Because then those agencies, those federal agencies too, you, there, you know, there's like, again, we're dealing with laws here, NAGPRA items, Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. There are certain items called cult, uh, items of cultural patrimony. You know, you have an archeologist that uh, may be able to get a hold of tribal people and say, you know, we have whatever it is and you know, how, what would you like us to do with it is if it's on federal lands and some state, even state offices will say, hey, you know, maybe that's part of a grave good. In Utah, we, they recognize grave goods. And even if they're not with a grave, they recognize that fact too. So that falls under the purview of the um, Native American Remains and Review Committee. So you've got, that's, that's gonna be, you know, you've got to figure out where you are in the landscape and who owns that that parcel of land you're on. So I know that's not, a, probably not what you wanted to hear, but that, that's kind of, have to give you that direction. Thanks. Uh -huh. I'll, I'll throw out a more general um, question. What, um, what do you enjoy most about the work that you do? Like, what do you, what do you take them, yeah, um, what's, yeah, what do you enjoy most about the work that you do? So I've, I'm, I'm older now, you know, I used to, I used to get out on the flat tops in Colorado and we did um, a thing called uh, Thinking Like a You, the White River Force um, service would take out, um, some of their staff and we'd spend a whole week out in, in on the flat top somewhere and we would do um, training like cultural sensitivity training with them we'd go out and look at things in the wilderness and camp for a whole week and and just cliff and i always called it that was our recharging because we got to be out in the field i mean you know for seven days and it was great and i really like i really did enjoy that um, but uh, now I really enjoy talking to young people. I really do um, believe, again, like I said, that they are our future and that you know those people are going to be the ones that's going to help the tribe. These kids are going to be the ones to help the tribes to persevere and, and, and manage these lands in, in uh, culturally appropriate ways. And so I really like talking to them. But, you know, I also, um, I also like the fact overall that I probably saw things and experienced things that the average person will never have an opportunity to completely um, see that. And I, I spent a lot of time with Mr. Duncan and uh, Mr. Naranjo and Terry, and I got to be the fly on the wall. I was the coffee getter and the donut finder and whatever, but I was privy to those to those talks and, and listening to them speaking you on the landscape and talking about things in our language while we were out there experiencing it. And those things are some of the um, times and the memories that I will always cherish, but I, I really like um, connecting with our with our with our people because for us our kids are losing this history quicker than anybody they don't have that opportunity to experience these things because we're over here and you know like I said our I'm an uncle probably we were removed from Colorado so when we're talking about some of these things and and talking about the Ute language, they don't have that. Their life has been always on this reservation. 
and you know the reservation is like a petri glass dish things that happen in that in that confined space are at a higher rate than what they do across the open areas i'll give you an example you know unemployment they say oh and unemployment's seven percent well here on the reservation where we used to be about 50 percent you know our young people are taking their lives at a higher rate than, than most um, people out there, in, even in the inner cities. So there is a lot of things that, um, you know, I, I, I've had a really good, I've had a really good life. I've had a charmed life. I, I've been able to do things and I'm trying to um, spread out and give that experience to other, to, to the younger children, people here too on the reservation and also um, for the larger society, their, their children, because that's where it's gonna happen. That's where that coming together is really going to make a difference because it, it, is, it is so apples and oranges. But I do, I like working with young kids. I like working with people. I like to be surprised and people tell me things and I get to tell them things and, you know, I'm in the time of my life where I'm a grandmother and a great grandmother now. And so I really like that. I really like being where I am and, and having that knowledge. And I'm, that's what I like about my, my work, you know, as I've been able to, and I'm fortunate that I could have worked in the same, same position, doing the same thing and having the growth that um, our office has had and the growth in myself. This is something that nobody really know, knows about me, but, um, so I wasn't an enrolled member of the tribe until I was in my 20s because the Ute tribe here in Utah, we have the blood, highest blood quorum for our tribal members. You have to be five eights. That's high. You have to be more than half to be enrolled in the Ute tribe here. Most tribes, it's a quarter or a 16. So I wasn't enrolled. I'm an only child and I was only raised with my mom. So I went through high school here at the public high school and I'm brown, but I'm not a tribal member when I'm growing up. So a lot of things were geared to tribal members. So they would pull me out of class to go do these great and wonderful things. And then they would like, oh, but you're not enrolled. You have to go back to class. So I had that experience all the way through high school. I really grew to resent the tribe. I really grew to be, you know, I didn't want any part of them. I didn't want to be part of that. They didn't want me, I didn't want them. That was kind of how I grew up. And I, I was very, very shy because I'm an only child, only with my mom. I just, I'm an only child. And so I really had this really, I guess I chip on my shoulder basically. So um, when I started working for the um, energy and minerals department, it was because my aunt worked there and they needed some um, clerical help. And uh, so she, they hired me as a summer youth and I went there and I started working. And from that, I grew this where I am today. But, you know, that's something that nobody knows. But I know that if you nurture and you, um, provide opportunities that people will uh, see your side of it and they may step up to help you. And that's how I got to where I am now. And I am enrolled now because, uh, uh, you know, things changed and, and I was able to get enrolled. And so I am an enrolled member now, but, you know, things, there are things in ways that you can affect other people's lives and you know we have to all be on the lookout for that. So anyway, that's something that I've never told other people, but I'm t I'm telling you. So uh, I I would just want you to know that that you can make a difference in people's lives. Thanks for sharing that and for sure. yeah for giving giving that gift to us. Well, so. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. You guys love it, listening to me, you know. 
and that that's a that's another thing is I appreciate you really to, um, listening to me. I uh, again, you know, I'm I'm at that stage in my life that I'm just uh, realizing uh, that um, I'm a grandma and a great grandma, and and that's why my grandma used to talk so much. <laughs> anyway so speaking of that speaking of kind of that um speaking from that perspective let me ask like a final a final question which is just um is there anything else you'd like us to know or anything that we should have asked i just i would like you to know that um i think there's a lot of hope <laughs> i thought very doomsday sometimes. And I think that every everybody in, in being curious and all of that is all good. It's all, it's all good. Um, we as people need to be people. We need to make that recognition. And I know that there's a lot of um, diversity out there. And I, I do um, find it quite fascinating to know too that um, where you come from or other people come from and how they got here and how that worked because um, we're all people at the end of the day. But um, you know, as far as, as consultation and tribal working in this realm of cultural resources that um, all Indians are not alike. We all have our own ways and not everybody you know, is the same. And so don't group us together. Don't lump us all the same. Even as the three Ute tribes, I think somebody said something about federal tribes. Or I just said that there were two Ute tribes in Colorado and we are all, there's three Ute tribes and then we are all federally recognized. But, um, you know, even us as the three Ute tribes with our 13 bands, the bands are our family system. And so not all the, the bands do the things the same way. It may be a little different from family to family. And even the Ute tribes as far as our cultures, we may be the three sister tribes, but we do, we do things a little different. So, you know, that, that, that recognition that we're not all the same is one of the most important things. And if you won't lump, tribal people together, then I don't think you'll um, put your foot in your mouth too often when you're around tribal folks. So, but I do invite all of you to come to, we have a powwow at the end of, the, of June. It's open, it's free. You know, the tribe celebrates since we've been in the pandemic. We've, um, last year was the first time that we've had started having powwows. So we do powwows here and that's in summer, the last weekend in June, so. You want to see some youth dance? Come on over. We have the bear dance. We have three bear dances in the spring. That's our. Um, that's kind of like our new year. We have the uh, bear dances um, welcoming the spring to the earth. So, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for that invitation. Sure. I might, might take you up on that. <laughs> and. Sure. Thanks. And thanks again for the, for the gift of this conversation and, and yeah, sharing and, you know, being willing to talk about some of the, some of the hard things that we've asked about. And yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time sure. to be here and um, yeah, to our audience, thank, thank you all for coming and I want to thank the friends and foundation for making this possible. And uh, yeah, I think we'll leave it there and just Betsy, thank you. Thank you again. We appreciate it. Thank you. I got a shout out to Sue. I haven't saw her for a thousand years. She works for the Rock Mountain National Park too. So <laughs> Sue Langdon. So good to see you. Not see you, read you, whatever. <laughs> All right. Thanks. All right. Thanks. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>